There's an increasing need for valid cross-cultural instruments for assessment of diverse older populations in most world regions. I will summarize the main challenges of conducting cognitive assessments in culturally, linguistically and educationally diverse older populations based on research in cross-cultural neuropsychology and present novel solutions to valid cognitive assessment in diverse older populations. Throughout my talk, I will try to relate research findings from other world regions to the Greater Bay Area context. Despite recent advances in development and implementation of biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia disorders, neuropsychological testing retains a key role in the clinical assessment of dementia. However, many of the conventional neuropsychological tests used in dementia diagnostics are biased by cultural, linguistic and educational factors and may even be inappropriate or misleading when assessing people originating from non-Western cultures. As in other world regions, currently there's a lack of validated instruments for assessment of culturally and linguistically diverse populations in Europe. However, with the increasing diversity in older populations, the availability of instruments for accurate diagnosis and, <clears throat> sorry, and of cognitive functioning in people from diverse backgrounds becomes increasingly important to ensure proper diagnosis and treatment. The term cross-cultural neuropsychology was first introduced by the Colombian-American neuropsychologist Alfredo Adila. Although cultural influences on the presentation and clinical features of neurocognitive disorders and on functional and structural organization of the brain have been the focus of research in cross-cultural neuropsychology, most research has addressed cultural influences on cognitive processes as measured by neuropsychological tests. As stated by Ossel and co-workers, culture dictates what is and what is not relevant in a situation and provides specific models of thinking, acting and feeling. Cognitive abilities measured during neuropsychological assessment correlate with many factors including an individual's learning opportunities and contextual experience within a culture. In cross-cultural neuropsychological assessments, there are three important factors to consider, culture, language, and education. Cultural traditions, rules, and values prescribe how people should act, feel, and think in different situations. And this may also affect how people behave in a cognitive test situation. In cognitive assessment of immigrants or other cultural minorities, cultural distance between the examiner and examinee and the level of acculturation of the examinee may also affect the test situation and the resulting cognitive test results. When it comes to language, languages may differ greatly in phonology, semantics, syntax and prosody, which greatly complicates assessment of language dysfunction or aphasia across languages. Also, different writing systems may affect test paradigms included in traditional Western tests when used in other contexts. This is especially evident in languages that do not rely on the Latin alphabet such as many Chinese languages. There is evidence that bilingualism and multilingualism may have a more direct impact on several cognitive abilities, but at a more practical level, it may also be difficult to decide which language the examinee should be tested in. For instance, in people where the mother tongue differs from the language used during schooling, how do we decide which language is the best test language? Finally, there are numerous issues 
when using both informal and formal interpreters during cognitive assessments. One of the most important factors to consider in all cognitive assessment is the level of education, as performances on most cognitive tests correlate with years of education. However, the length of the school day and year, curriculum and quality of what is being taught may differ greatly between countries and even between schools within countries. Finally, cognitive assessment of people who are illiterate and without formal schooling may be extremely challenging as they may never have acquired the knowledge and skills needed to solve many traditional cognitive tests. In the following, I will give examples on how these three factors, culture, language and education, may affect cognitive testing. One of the main challenges, challenges in co cross-cultural cognitive assessment is that most traditional cognitive tests have been developed in and for weird cultures. That is, Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic cultures. This may make them less relevant in other contexts, as people from weird cultures represent only a small minority of humanity as a whole. Thus, the elements and stimuli used in cognitive screening tests, such as the Minimental State Examination or Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or an object naming test, such as the Boston Naming Test, may be unfamiliar or virtually unknown to people from other cultures. For instance, pictures of a beaver and a pretzel included in the Boston Naming Test may be well familiar to people from North America, but may be unfamiliar, even unknown to people from other world regions. But even when tests include no obvious culture-specific elements or stimuli, the way we approach and solve tests may be affected by a cultural background. For instance, cognitive tests are oftentimes we use a stopwatch. The concept of time, however, and speed of performance have proven to be highly culture dependent and with higher performances often being observed on speeded tests in people from individualistic and highly competitive cultures, such as the North American culture. Language effects have been observed on several cognitive tests and differences between languages often complicate test translation and cultural adaptation of conventional Western cognitive tests. For instance, differences between languages have been observed to affect performances on tasks such as repetition of the month backwards. For instance, in Mandarin Chinese, names of the month are just called month one, month two, month three, and so on, which is quite different from the way the month are named in English. And thus, the complexity of this task is much greater in English compared to Mandarin Chinese. Also, the way we categorize the world may be affected by a cultural background. In this older study, U.S. children and Chinese children were compared on a categorization test. They were asked to categorize these three objects, so which two belong together, whereas American children were more likely to say the chicken and the cow belong together because they're animals. The Chinese children were more likely to say the cow and the grass belongs together because the cow eats grass. So the focus was quite different in the way they categorized these three items. Differences have also been observed on digit span tasks, where you need to repeat a series of digits in the same order, where it's seen that digit span is longer in Cantonese compared to English speakers. Uh, generally, a mean 
digit span of seven is found in English speakers, whereas in Cantonese it's ten digits. Um, also, it's observed that digit span is longer in English than in Spanish, and even in bilingual Welsh English speaking children, their digit span was better in the second language compared to the first language, that is, better in English than in Welsh. And the explanation for this is usually the, the word length effects, that is, in English, for instance, the words for the digits 1 to 9 are longer compared to Cantonese, and in Spanish they are longer than in English, and the same is true for Welsh, the names of the digits are longer than in English. And this puts greater demand on the phonological loop, uh, which is part of the working memory. So that's the explanation that's usually provided. Also, translation or adaption of language tests that require phonetic fluency, uh, that is, producing as many words as you can beginning with a particular letter, that may be F, A, or S, or the train making test that requires people to alternate between numbers and letters of the alphabet in an ascending order, may be difficult if you are unfamiliar with the Latin alphabet or use a different writing system. So in Chinese, where there's no alphabet, and it's actually more or less impossible to make these tasks. Also, there are multiple levels of multilingualism, and it may be hard to decide which language is the best to use for cognitive testing. Many bi- and multilinguals have one or more languages that are predominantly spoken in their public lives, and another language that is predominantly spoken in their private lives. Thus, the vocabulary across these languages may to some extent be context-specific. Importantly, the ability to get by in everyday life in your second or third language does not guarantee that cognitive testing in these languages is viable. As stated earlier, performances on most cognitive tests correlate with years of education. This is especially evident in the case of people who are illiterate and with little or no formal education. Effects of literacy have repeatedly been observed on tests of general cognitive functioning, such as the Minimental State Examination and Montreal Cognitive Assessment. On several language tests, including repetition of words and sentences, object naming tests and verbal fluency tests. Also, influences have been observed on calculation and number processing tasks, such as backwards subtraction tasks and the digit span test, on visual constructional tests, including copying of both simple and more complex figures that are typically included in cognitive screening tests and on the block design tests. Effects of literacy have also been observed on a range of motor function tests requiring alternating or sequencing of movements of one or both hands. On metalinguistic awareness, including understanding of an an identification of phonemes and of grapheme phoneme correspondences. Finally, effects of literacy are often observed on the traditional test paradigms used in memory tests, including the recall of word lists, of stories, and figures. Also, formal education provides test wiseness. That is, people with formal school experience are familiar with the test situation and instinctively know what's expected and how to behave in this particular context. This may not be the case for test naive people.
this, the association between education and cognitive test performance is not linear. Rather, the association is a decelerating curve attending to a plateau with the greatest effects between having no education and just a couple of years of education and little further effects after approximately 12 years of education. Here, this is illustrated for the Minimental State Examination and Animal Fluency Test in a sample of middle-aged and older Turkish immigrants in Germany and Denmark. As diagnostic properties and cutoff values reported for most conventional Western cognitive tests are based on populations with nine years of education or more, where we often see no or only small educational effects. These diagnostic properties and cutoff values may not be representative for lower educated populations. So how do these findings relate to the Greater Bay Area context? Cantonese is the dominant language across the region. However, in Hong Kong, biliteracy and trilingualism in English and Chinese languages is the official policy. Also in Macau, Portuguese is an official language and several other languages are commonly spoken in everyday life throughout the region, including both local languages and dialects and the languages of different immigrant communities. Educational levels are highly variable, both across and within regions in the GBA, with relatively high levels of illiteracy in some regions. Although several tests for early diagnosis of cognitive impairment are available in Chinese languages, there are concerns about the reliability and validity of conventional or anglocentric cognitive tests in the multilingual environment of the GBA. Thus, it's been suggested that screening tests should be designed for older people who have lower levels of literacy and can be administered in any dialect spoken in both the rural and urban populations of the GBA. Traditionally, cognitive tests used outside Western countries have been cultural adaptions of conventional tests. However, some limitations of this approach has been observed and often it's quite challenging or difficult to make proper cultural and language adaptions. I'll try to exemplify this with the Chinese Beijing adaption of the Montreal Cognitive Assessment that was later used in a study in Eastern China. In this study, it was observed that despite cultural adaption of the alternating tray making test using Chinese characters instead of the Latin alphabet, this task was highly difficult for people with low or no education. And this had previously also been observed in a study in Hong Kong by Wong and colleagues. It was also seen that almost 60% of the participants were unable to name pictures of a rhinoceros and a camel included in the mocha. In the memory tests, use of words such as velvet and church made it hard for many participants to memorize the word list as these words were unfamiliar and not part of the everyday vocabulary. And in both people with and without formal education, about half were unable to tell the similarity between a watch and a ruler. So despite using a Chinese adaption of the mocha, several cultural and language issues remained. A different approach has been the development of cross-cultural cognitive tests, that is, 
tests that were specifically designed for the cross-cultural and cross-linguistic contexts. I'll give examples of this based on the research in the Danish Dementia Research Center uh, in collaboration with several European research centers. <clears throat> so these results are mainly based on a series of studies based on the European cross-cultural neuropsychological test battery. The aim of this test battery was, <clears throat> excuse me, was to design cognitive test instruments that were relevant for the assessment of cognitive impairment in Alzheimer's disease and other dementias that could be applied across ethnic groups in Europe and across languages spoken within and across these groups without need to change the content of the tests. Also, it should be possible to administer the test with an interpreter in a more or less straightforward manner. And finally, it should be possible to perform these tests with people with limited or no education. In many ways, this approach is novel uh, in test design as we tried to incorporate test elements and strategies that were known from everyday life, rather than including test elements known from the school system. And also we made great efforts to include elements that were relevant across cultural and language groups, uh, both majority and minority groups in Europe. All in all, so far, we have designed four different, or three different tests. Um, the main one being the, the European Cross Cultural Neuropsychological Test Battery. That is a proper neuropsychological test battery. It takes about 60 minutes to complete and requires some specialized training and experience with cognitive testing. Then we have designed and expanded screening tests called the Multicultural Cognitive Examination that can be administered in about half an hour by trained uh, health personnel. We've also done quite a bit of work with the Roland Universal Dementia Assessment Scale developed by Joel Story and co-workers in Australia. And finally, uh, we have recently designed and published uh, the Brief Assessment of Impaired Cognition that takes less than five minutes to administer. In the following, I'll present results for the screening tests, but will not have time to go through the full neuropsychological test battery. So first of all, the Roland Universal Dementia Assessment Scale was initially developed in Australia for screening for dementia in multicultural populations. It was introduced as an alternative to the mini mental state examination and takes about 10 minutes to complete. At the MMNC, it covers several cognitive domains and has zero to 30 points. It requires no equipment, but only has a test sheet uh, and you need a pen, that's it. The main difference between the test items in the RUDAS and the MMSE is that items in the RUDAS are generally something that's familiar to people from everyday life. For instance, instead of uh, encoding and recalling three words that are, have no obvious connection to each other, here you tell a small story about that you're going shopping and you need to memorize for grocery items that you need to recall at a later time. Also, instead of asking about semantic categories or similarities tests, here there's a judgment test that requires people to tell you which precautions they would take if they had to cross a busy street with no street lamps or pedestrian crossing. Again, something that's known from everyday life. Today, the RUDAS is 
the most widely used and validated cross-cultural cognitive tests globally. And it's been included in several studies in both high income countries and low and middle income countries and has Chinese versions from Taiwan and mainland China. In these studies, the routers has generally been translated directly from English into the target languages without need to make any cultural adaptions. The main one being the shopping list that includes tea as one of the items that was found to be culturally less relevant in Spain and Latin America and substituted by the word coffee. But this is a minor cultural adaption. In these studies, the rudus is found to be relatively unaffected by gender, cultural background, and language use, but education slightly affects test scores in low educated populations, for instance, in studies in, in India, Thailand, and Turkish immigrant populations in Denmark, in Lebanon, and other minority populations in Europe. Recently, my colleague Kasper Jørgensen and I did a systematic review and meta-analysis of the routers um, and compared diagnostic accuracy across high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries. What we found across the studies was that both sensitivity and specificity measures across all studies included in the meta-analysis were quite good, uh, close to 0.80 for both measures. When comparing the diagnostic accuracy between high income countries and low and middle income countries, we didn't see many differences. In high income countries, specificity was a little higher than sensitivity, whereas the opposite picture was found in low and middle income countries, where sensitivity was slightly higher than specificity. These small differences are most likely due to a lower educational level in low and middle income country settings compared to high income country settings that decreases specificity uh, in the low and middle income country settings. In the systematic review, we also found two papers that directly compared diagnostic accuracy of the MMSC MOCA and Edinburgh's cognitive examination with the RUDAS in the same population. These studies were performed in Spain and in New Zealand. Uh, and actually, the diagnostic ac accuracy was more or less comparable across these four instruments in these studies. We were also able to make a comparison between the RUDAS and the MMSC in this meta-analysis and found that the area under the curve values were a little higher for the RUDAS, but that this was not significant. But in any case, the RUDAS is at least as sensitive and precise as other cognitive screening tests but has the advantage of being more easily applied in multicultural and multilingual contexts compared to other screening tests. We've also done studies with the RUDAS in Lebanon, uh, where we developed a demograph based on a regression equation, um, whereby we combined data for the routers with the informant report from the <clears throat> IQ code in an Arabic speaking clinical population. This population, in this population, about half were illiterate. And our aim with these studies was to improve cognitive screening in a low educated, illiterate Arabic speaking population.
So based on this regression equation, we were able to make a weighted sum method for combining the rulers and the IQ code, as you see depicted here. So the way it works is that you have your ruler score. For instance, you have a score of 22, which is just a cutoff in this population. Uh, but then what happens if you also have data for the IQ code, that is informant report information? So for instance, if you get a score on the IQ code that varies between one and five with higher scores indicating more cognitive impairment, if you have a score of 3.3, then you are more likely to be okay. However, if scores increase to, let's say, 3.7, it's more likely that you're actually ill and should be referred for further assessments and investigations. So using this demograph in the clinical population, we found quite good diagnostic accuracy um, and were actually able to significantly improve diagnostic accuracy of the rooters used alone by combining it with the IQ code. We then went on to apply the demograph in an epidemiological research study uh, focusing on the prevalence of dementia in Lebanon. Here we compared the diagnostic accuracy of the rooters to the 1066 dementia research group dementia diagnosis and of the demograph compared to the 1066 dementia diagnosis. And as you see on this slide, the specificity of using the rooters alone was quite poor, actually, where sensitivity was high. And we correctly identified more or less 67% uh, of patients and healthy people. However, by using the demograph, we were able to improve the specificity, the specificity significantly uh, and now correctly identified almost 92% of patients and healthy people. So this is a good indicator that when doing epidemiological studies in dementia prevalence, the inclusion of informant report can be quite important and that it might be well challenging or problematic to rely on results from cognitive tests alone, even when using a culturally relevant test. So an example of this concern is this recent uh, review and meta-analysis of dementia prevalence studies in China, looking at both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So here, the authors included 35 studies comparing illiterate and non-literate populations. And what they found was that the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease was, was three times higher in illiterate compared to non-literate populations. Although there may be some protective effects of education, it's highly unlikely that these effects will result in a factor three difference between these populations. And I do suspect that many of these studies included in the meta-analysis have based their prevalence data on cognitive test results alone. So this may be something to consider in prevalence studies to use informant report or a two-stage diagnostic approach. Moving on to the multicultural cognitive examination. This takes a little longer than the rooters, but this is an extended cognitive screening test that incorporates the rooters, but extends assessment of memory function, executive or language function, and visual spatial function. 
The memory test included in the multicultural cognitive examination is the recall of pictures test that includes immediately at immediate recall, delayed recall, and recognition of 10 pictures, as you see down in the left-hand corner. Um, then it includes a verbal fluency test requiring production of things you can buy in the supermarket within one minute. And finally, a visuospatial test called the clock reading test, where participants are required to read the time on a series of 12 clock faces without any numbers on them. So far, the MCE has been validated across European ethnic minority and majority groups across six countries uh, in a population where about one fifth were illiterate. It's been applied in more than 20 languages without need to change any of the content. We found that the MCE is relatively unaffected by gender, cultural background and language, but that education affects test scores in low educated people. We also found that besides using a cutoff value to screen for dementia, the MCE may actually also be used to evaluate different subtypes uh, of dementia by looking at cognitive profiles or different scores across cognitive domains. So this might be an additional improvement for the clinical evaluation of dementia by using this test uh, instead of the rooters alone. However, this requires further evidence as it's only been examined in a very small subpopulation in this initial study. When comparing the diagnostic accuracy of the MCE compared to using the rooters alone, we found that the MCE had a significantly better diagnostic accuracy as shown by the area under the curve values. Importantly, in 14 patients with dementia who scored in the normal range on the rooters, 10 were classified as cognitively impaired on the MCE, which indicates that the MCE may have a particular advantage in people in the earlier stages of dementia, or maybe even the MCI stage. Finally, I'll describe uh, a very recently developed test from the Danish Dementia Research Center called the Brief Assessment of Impaired Cognition. Although this test was developed for and in the ethnic Danish majority, this was very much based on our experiences from the studies I have just uh, presented to you. So in this very brief test, that was designed to replace the mini mental state examination in general practice in Denmark. We included patient directed questions with cognitive testing and informant directed questions. So, more specifically, the basic consists of three questions from the cognitive function inventory uh, about memory and language function directed at the patients. Then there's the supermarket fluency test, which takes about one minute, and a very small category cued memory test that requires uh, controlled learning and recall of four colored pictures, specifically a banana, a bicycle, a cow, and a couch. And finally, there are three questions from the IQ code for an informant, which might be a relative or another person with knowledge about the patient. The basic has 0 to 25 points and can be applied in about 5 minutes or less. So far, it's been validated for dementia and MCI, or mild cognitive impairment, in Denmark in a sample of 
428 people, with none being illiterate. However, very recently, the basic was published in a Mandarin Chinese version without need for any cultural adaption. Actually, the author stated that one of the advantages of the basic was that it included no cultural specific elements and mainly relied on questions from everyday life. In our studies in Denmark, the basic is relatively unaffected by education, but gender was found to have a small impact on test scores with females having slightly higher scores than males. When looking at the diagnostic accuracy for the basic compared to the MMSC, which is a more complex test taking 10 minutes, we found significantly better diagnostic accuracy for the shorter basic test for both dementia and mild cognitive impairment. Especially, we found that if you look at the right hand panel, we see that there's a very significant improvement uh, for screening for MCI by using the basic compared to the MMSC. So this is certainly an advantage of the basic that it's much shorter to administer, but it has a much better sensitivity to the early cognitive uh, challenges that's seen in mild cognitive impairment. So for my concluding remarks, there seems to be a need for valid cognitive instruments for assessment of diverse older populations in the Greater Bay Area. This is due to the cultural, linguistic and educational diversity in older populations in the region, and that the available instruments for accurate assessment of cognitive uh, functioning in people from diverse backgrounds is to some extent lacking, and it is important to provide these instruments. One of the issues is that cross-cultural assessment with conventional uh, anglocentric cognitive tests may be inappropriate due to the cultural, linguistic, and educational biases often found on these tests. However, several promising cognitive instruments have been designed for assessment of older people with diverse cultural, linguistic, and educational characteristics in other parts of the world. And although both the CNTB, the MCE, and BASIC, as well as the RUDIS, were originally designed for cognitive assessment of multicultural populations in Europe and Australia, they may be relevant to the Greater Bay Area context as well. Finally, I'd like to thank my many national and international collaborators in Denmark, across Europe, uh, in Brazil, and in Lebanon. Thank you very much for your attention.